Thank you. And well, this is very loud today. Uh, thank you all for coming. I know very first talk of the last day is always a tough one, so thank you all for sticking it out. Appreciate it. Um, so yeah, as Julio said, I want to talk today a little bit about the NeoWise mission, and this is the mission I've been working on for the last 10 years. Um, basically, since I finished graduate school, my first postdoc was on NeoWise, and I got to join the mission uh, two months before launch. So I showed up at JPL right before the spacecraft launched, and so really kind of hit the ground running, um, and have been involved with this mission ever since in all of its iterations. Um, and so I kind of want to share with you some of the results we've gotten in the solar system, uh, touch a little bit on the non-solar system results, because there's a lot of that as well, um, and then move into what our next generation plans are. Neowise, the spacecraft, um, won't be around forever, and there is, you know, we, we're looking forward to what's the next thing we can do to get that next order of magnitude, that next step forward. Um, but let's start with Neowise today. And so uh, the Neowise mission that is currently flying is led by Amy Meinzer. Uh, ooh, that's an old slide. She recently moved to University of Arizona. Um, and it's funded out of NASA's Planetary Defense Coordination Office, which used to be the NEOO program when it was originally, uh, originally funded. And what it did is it took the WISE spacecraft that was in orbit, the one that launched in 2009, and turned it back on. So what happened was the WISE spacecraft was launched, completed its survey, and was put in hibernation. And NASA had asked us, to look into the idea of putting a small telescope to survey for asteroids on a geostationary satellite. They said, we have this opportunity to do a co-manifest. What would it, what, how good would it be and how much would it cost? And in doing that analysis, we said, okay, here's an answer to that question. But it turns out it's cheaper and better if you just turn this spacecraft back on. And so they said, oh, that's interesting. Send us a proposal. How do we do that? And so that's how NEOWISE started. Um, so we brought it out of hibernation in October of 2013. Now, um, the WISE spacecraft was designed to be cryogenically cooled. And when it ran out of cryogen, the mission ended. And so what happens is it's in low Earth polar orbit. It's going around the Earth, always pointed away from the center of the Earth, looking out into space. And it follows the day-night terminator. So it will go around the Earth, looking out. Every 94 minutes, it completes an orbit. And so it scans rings of the sky. What happened was, when we were in hibernation, they just pointed it in one direction and just let it orbit the Earth. And what, what that means is that half of the orbit, it was looking at the Earth. And the Earth is very warm. And so the interior of the telescope warmed up to a couple hundred Kelvin. So we had to turn it back on in October, but it wasn't until December of 2013 that it had cooled down enough to be able to take images again. And so our survey restarted uh, December, uh, December 13th, 2013. And originally, we were planning on doing three and a half years of survey. That was the, the main goal of the mission. Uh, we are now just about to complete the sixth year of survey. And so what's happened is, every time we get near the end of our survey, we reanalyze the data and we say, the sensitivity is the same, everything's looking good, and the orbit isn't drifting as bad as we thought. Because when you're in a low Earth polar orbit, so it's this really funky orbit that's designed to keep you at 90 degrees, you know, at a 90 degree solar elongation at all times. But in order to do that, and you have an orbit that processes, so over six months, it does one turn around the Earth, and so you're matching the Earth's rotation. But to do that, you're in a low Earth orbit, 94 minutes. And so you're getting some atmospheric drag. And so over time, that orbit moves from the 90 degree line to, you know, now we're 20 degrees off. So one side of our orbit is at 70 degrees from the sun, so over here, and the other one is at 110 degrees from the sun. And so that twist is what will eventually end the mission, most likely, because when you're pointed here, when you're moving towards the sun, you can't look at the sun and the Earth at the same time. You, you have to look at one of them, basically. You can't keep them both out of the telescope. But the orbital drift has been very slow because over the last five years, the sun has been very, very quiet. And with a quiet sun, the atmosphere isn't puffy, and so the orbit doesn't twist as much as we anticipated. So we've been very fortunate. We're now running, again, we're, we are currently been asked by NASA to plan to run through June of 2020. So for what was originally a three and a half year mission, running through six and a half years is great news and just shows that how well the spacecraft was built, that everything's still functioning, knock on wood. But our science goals for this reactivated survey 
or to look at near-Earth objects at mid-infrared wavelengths and provide characterization for them, as well as discovery of new objects. So NEOWISE is not necessarily the best survey for discovering new small asteroids, but what we provide is the physical characterization, those diameters and albedos that ground-based surveys can't get. Um, and so as I mentioned, NEOWISE started, so this is actually the WISE spacecraft in the clean room at Ball. Um, it's actually kind of small. It's only a 40 centimeter telescope in here. This is a giant thermos bottle. We lovingly refer to it as R2-D2 because it looks like R2-D2. Um, so this is the telescope and oh, where the cryogen was originally in the entire cryostat and thermos. Solar panel, you have here, that's the spacecraft bus where all the computers are, the reaction wheels, um, and you, this is your downlink antenna. What's fascinating about this is that we don't have any fuel on board. Yeah, there's zero fuel, and that's unusual. So it means we can't change our orbit. Most spacecraft have small amounts of hydrazine on board, and that's because as you move your telescope around, your momentum wheels that you use for controlling the direction, these go faster and faster and faster, and you have to dump momentum. You have to slow them down. Instead, WISE has three of these, and they're magnetic torque rods. They're just metal bars with inductance wires on them, and you turn them on, and it's in a low enough orbit that it is able to torque against the magnetic field of the Earth and dump momentum from its wheels into the Earth's rotation, which is always just fascinating. But because of that, there are now no consumables on board. Once we ran out of cryogen, it's completely consumable free. And that has been great because it means that when you plan for three and a half years, you can keep going as long as everything keeps working. So NEOWISE started originally as the WISE mission. And so this was a mid-class explorer mission in the astrophysics director. It was never meant for planetary science. And it was originally designed for a six-month survey. So, you know, a spacecraft built to run for six months that's coming up on 10 years is really impressive. Um, and it was supposed to do four simultaneous infrared wavelengths. And so what we do is when we look at a patch of sky, the light is passed through three sets of beam splitters. And so you get four different colors all simultaneously, four different band passes of the same area of sky at the same moment. So it removes a lot of uncertainty with variability, both for asteroids and stars and galaxies. Nothing's changing because you're integrating over the same amount of time, and so you get very accurate relative colors as well as absolute fluxes. So our four wavelengths were 3.4 microns, 4.6, one at 12, and one at 22. Um, these two detectors were a technology called Mercury Cadmium Telluride. So this is a pretty standard detector, um, but until recently it could only go out to around five, six microns. These can operate, so these are the ones that are currently operating on NEOWISE. They can run at 70 to 77 degrees. Right now we're running at 78 Kelvin. And they're functioning perfectly. These two detectors, because WISE was launched in 2009, which means it was built in the five years before that, so the older technology detectors, these were something called silicon arsenic. They, are, they were very sensitive at these wavelengths, but they had to be kept at four Kelvin. This is why we had to have a cryostat that was filled with solid hydrogen ice, which is exactly as dangerous as it sounds. And so what you had to do was actually run liquid helium through the cryostat, through this metal aluminum foam, and spray gaseous hydrogen in there so it would be deposited as ice inside the cryostat. And that's what kept our detectors cold originally. So when that ran out, these were immediately blinded by the glow from the telescope. Once the telescope was above 4 Kelvin, it began glowing at these wavelengths, and so blinded the first detector. And then once the intern, we had an interior uh, cryostat that kept the detectors cold, when that ran out of uh, energy, when that ran out of cryogen, uh, this detector warmed up and it started glowing at the wavelengths it was looking at. So we lost these two um, shortly after we ran out of cryogen. So we were launched December 14th, 2009 on the sun synchronous orbit I told you about, and we surveyed from January 14th. So we had one month after launch to figure out how to control the spacecraft in space, to make sure it was pointed in the right direction, to eject the cover, to do all the calibrations that we needed, because as the spacecraft scan, the spacecraft is not stepping and pointing. The spacecraft is just doing a constant sweep through the sky. So there's a little mirror on board, a scan mirror. And every 11 seconds, it tilts one direction, basically spends 8.8 .8 seconds going this way, and then 2.2 going back. And 8.8 .8 going this way, and 2.2 going back. And what that does is that freezes the sky on your detectors. 
So this limits our exposure time. We can only observe any one patch of sky for 8.8 .8 seconds, and that sets our sensitivity limit. But we had to then calibrate that over the next two weeks, and then we began our survey on January 14th. It's 11 seconds between exposures, but we only integrate for, so we integrate for 8.8 .8 seconds in all bands. However, due to some unusual characteristics of these two detectors, um, in, so when you look at a CCD detector, you basically just count the number of picks, you, you basically turn on the, open up the shutter, photons hit the camera, and then you shuffle the charge over and you count how, much, how many electrons were there in your readout. These are uh, a different kind of detector where you actually have what's called sample of the ramp reading. And this is you have your detector in the front and every pixel is bonded to a readout on the back. And so instead of shuffling charge, because charge shuffling is inefficient on these detectors, you have a whole patch of readouts on the back. And what you do is you read every one second, or every 1.1 seconds. And so you look, and then what you're, what you're looking for now is you fit a slope to those readouts. And that slope gives you the flux of your source. However, um, due to some unusual characteristics of these detectors, the first readout you take can, will sometimes have an arbitrary gauge offset. So we discard that one, and then you fit a slope to the rest. So the effective integration time of these two is 7.7 .7 seconds. But that's it. We can't stop and stare, because we're constantly scanning. Um, and so this is one of the limitations of the survey. If we discover something cool, we can't follow it up ourselves because the orbit is constantly sweeping at one degree per day, and the detector is constantly going, it can only spend eight, second, eight and a half seconds or 8.8 .8 seconds in any one patch at any one time. So you can't really go back and check again. And so that's driven a lot of our need for optical ground-based fault. When you find a new near-Earth object, you have a one-day orbital arc that's good enough to predict where it's going to be next week, but not next year. And so you need additional detections. And so as we get to the end of the talk, this will drive a lot of the requirements we put on the next generation system um, because we want to ensure we don't need to rely on any more for follow-up. So the original uh, WISE mission was PI by Ned Wright, who's a professor at UCLA. Um, this, by the way, is one of my favorite pictures. This is an infrared picture of the launch of an infrared telescope. And I really like it because I got to take it. So they said, I, I just, like I said, I just started, and they said, here, postdoc, take this infrared camera, go stand in the woods there at the launch facility. And so I got to be even closer than the VIP zone for the launch. So I'm sitting there in the woods with the press box and taking the infrared picture. It was a lot of fun. Um, it was also like 6 in the morning, so it was very early. <laughs> you had to be up like 4 in the morning to get on the bus to go out there and set up. And, yeah. Anyway. So WISE. The original science goals of the last mission, I said, were astrophysical based. Right? So it was supposed to find the most luminous galaxies in the universe. So these interacting Eulergs and Hyperlergs, right? trying to find these super bright, infrared bright things that um, you heard Steve talk about the other day, right? galaxies colliding in the dust glowing in incredible volumes. It was supposed to find, as well, the coldest and closest brown dwarfs. So the two short wavelengths were actually designed the shortest wavelength, 3.4 microns, is supposed to fall inside the methane absorption band for a brown dwarf, and 4.6 is supposed to fall outside of all the absorption bands. So as you scan the sky, anything that only shows up in that second channel should be a methane-rich brown dwarf, a very faint star. And so it is an ideal system for searching for these coldest and closest stars. And it was supposed to make an infrared atlas for next generation surveys like James Webb Space Telescope because James Webb is a powerful instrument that can only look through a pinhole. And if you can only look at a pinhole, you have to know where you're pointing pretty precisely, and you have to know what's interesting to look at before you start looking with it. And so the idea here was find, do a big survey, find all the cool things that we need to look at more with James Webb. And so this is the all-sky map from WISE, from the four-band survey of the sky. And so it's in the galactic projection coordinates, and so you can see here this green stuff is the thermal emission from the dust in our galaxy. This is the plane of the galaxy in the middle. All the stars show up as blue. Any star anywhere is blue. So even if it's a red star, even Betelgeuse shows up as blue in these wavelengths because they are so far into the infrared. And so you can see here, this is the plane of the Milky Way. And quite apparently, the bulge shows up. Hmm? The halo, yeah. Yeah, so this is the bulge, you have the halo, you have the plane of the disk here. 
You have the large and small Magellanic clouds. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff in here. And so we were able to make this map using all of the data that we gathered. Um, you can see some really cool things like this incredibly red source here. There are some very red nebula. These are super cold. These are in the like you know 30 to 40 Kelvin range. These cold, dusty, star-forming regions where the stars are embedded inside an optically thick dust cloud. Um, there's also a few galaxies that you can that show up uh, incredibly bright as well. But because Wise was never designed for solar system, this was supposed to be the final product. They were actually going to throw away the individual frame data because as Wise scans, you get about. 10, about 10 to 12 observations of any patch of sky as it marches along. They were just going to add that together, make an atlas, and discard all of that single frame data, which means any sort of variability is lost, be it photometric variability or moving objects. And so this is where the NeoWISE mission came in. Originally, it was an add-on to WISE. It was a proposal to save those single frame data, archive them so the community had it, be it planetary science or astrophysics, and search for new objects. And so you can see here, this is a really beautiful nebula. You can see the dark, this is, so this red stuff, this is the really cold dust. The green is the hotter dust, and by hot, I mean room temperature. All the stars are blue, and you can see these chains of dots here. Those are the near-Earth objects, and the, and the main belt objects. These are all the asteroids here, marching across. Even you can see them against this background of haze. You can see them up here sticking out as different colored objects. And so this was our goal, was to look for all these moving things, pull them out, measure where their positions were in the sky, send that into the Minor Planet Center so we could record known objects and new objects, and then archive their positions of photometry. And so to do this, we developed a system called the WISE Moving Object Processing System, or WMOPS, because it's a fun acronym. And so all it did is it basically the computer went through and looked for all the things that were moving, all the transient sources. And now the computer would come up and say, all right, I think I found a source here. And it would take a little thumbnail of each of them and put them together. And so each column here represents a different time. And each at the center here is a detection the computer thinks is a real asteroid. And so it would give us a report like this. And it would show us the band 3 and the band 4. And you can see that this asteroid shows up in both bands quite clearly. And it would also give us some extra data. It would say, all right, here is the same RA depth before and after. Because sometimes it would get confused and think a star was transient, even if it was there before. And so you want to make sure there's no stars here. And it would also give us this data, this pre-center data. This is the same pixel XY coordinate one image before. And this is something we learned only later, is that these detectors, especially the silicon arsenic, have a significant problem with latent images. And so this is the same thing if you stare at a bright source, like you look up at the sun and then close your eyes, you get this after image on your retina. The silicon arsenic de detectors would get the same thing from even moderately bright sources in the thermal infrared. And so you would see these fuzzy objects floating around, and especially if they were a very bright asteroid or if it was something that a diffraction spike that was moving, it could look like a moving object. And so this is one of the ways we, we would look at the data to make sure we're not being fooled by some sort of other data set. And so uh, the computer, after giving us, after building this, would send it to a human and say, I think I found something. Is this real or is this not? And so we had human QA in the loop, helping to make sure to verify that everything the machine was finding was real. And so what that resulted in is this movie of our survey. And so this is showing every dot is when we detected an asteroid. Black shows the main belt and the Trojans. The blue are the comets. The green are near-Earth objects. And the red are near-Earth objects that were discovered by NeoWise. And so over the course of the first six months, we filled out the main belt. And what you'll notice is this cloud of objects here, the near-Earth objects. It's like a swarm of bees following the Earth. And this is important. Because over the span of about a year, our survey actually covered the entire main belt. But because of the synodic period difference, we're not really sensing the population of near-Earth objects that are living over here. And so this was the benefit of restarting the NEOWISE survey, was that the synodic periods of the NEOs mean you can survey for about 10 years before you start to overlap. 
your previous area. Um, now, you'll notice right here, there's kind of a change in density of the points. That's when we start to run out of cryogen. So we ran out of our coolant, and our sensitivity dropped off. We're still seeing objects in the main belt here, but we don't have that same level of sensitivity. We lost about one to two orders of magnitude of sensitivity in the main belt, because these objects are so cold, they're not showing thermal emission at the 4.6 micron wavelength. The NEOs, however, still are, and so this is how you can still run a survey that is highly sensitive to near-Earth objects, even without cryogen. And so the data that we got from this allowed us to constrain the physical properties. And so these are spectral energy distributions, so not very different from what you saw before for uh, active galaxies, showing the reflected optical component and thermal emission for a given asteroid. And so this is for an example asteroid, the same size and observing geometry, and all I'm varying here between the colors is what the geometric albedo is. And so the first thing to note is that the thermal emission doesn't really change because of your albedo. The thermal emission doesn't care about albedo per se, but the optical reflected light does. And this is how we can use the thermal data, if we can use the thermal data and constrain a diameter, then by having a single point in this region, you now have a strong constraint on albedo. And so when we have multiple thermal infrared wavelengths, so here, for instance, the near-Earth objects, bands 4, 3, and 2, that's these color bars are the wavelength coverage of each of our bands, are entirely thermally dominated. And so you have a lot of information about what the behavior of this thermal curve is. And that's how you can use that Needham model I talked about on Tuesday to constrain what the thermal properties of the surface are and then get you a diameter. You can see in the outer main belt here, so when you get farther from the sun, objects get colder. right? And so at the orbit of Earth at 1 AU, you expect around 300 Kelvin to be your, your basically your subsolar temperature. And if you do you know, your 3,000 over 300 for the uh, peak wavelength, you get a peak wavelength of right around 10-ish microns. In the outer main belt, where it's half the temperature, your thermal peak moves to W4. These are still thermally dominated, so you still get great sensitivity during the cryogenic mission, but you don't really have as good sensitivity in the, in the outer reaches of the main belt in the reactivated mission. So let's see, as I mentioned before, um, so you can see this was the final plot of all of the objects we detected. You can see this gap here again, that's where we ran out of cryogen. Um, but we continued in a post-cryogenic survey, partly to finish the survey of the main belt. We didn't know that we would get another chance. And so we wanted to do a complete survey of the main belt to, do have, to have a fair characterization of all of the parents of the families just to make sure we had the coverage of all of them for future uh, data. But, so in post-cryo, again, this is the same plot as before, uh, the same SED plot, just now with the two shortest wavelengths. Again, you see that you, can, you have thermal emission dominating band two, and sometimes it's dominating band one, sometimes it's not. Uh, whereas in the main belt, you, kind of, you still have sensitivity, but you don't have that same control over the thermal behavior, and so we don't really have as good information in the main belt in the post-cryo survey. But one of the things, you know, one of the things we're about, anytime you turn a spacecraft back on, you have no idea what had happened. It had been hibernating for two and three quarter years. No idea what's going on. So the first thing we did was take an image and compare it to one of the last images we took in the survey. And this was, a, this was taken in 2011 in the Prime mission. And this is the exact same patch of sky right after we turned it back on. And there's no difference. Yeah. And that's, that was amazing. There had been no damage to detectors due to sitting in a radiation environment for two extra years. There had been no changes in the cert. Nothing had broken. This was an amazing, when we got this photo down, it was really, it really made us feel good. So, as I said, we turned back on in December of 2013, and we've been going since. And so, this is the latest survey. So this is our five years of survey. This won't go faster because you have to pack five years. But we've been serving. And so if you watch this cloud of green near-Earth objects here, you see that they're still following us around. Even over the first, so here we're in 2016, we're not really co covering over the same near-Earth population. It takes about a decade to really start to only see things you've seen before. And you see this with even the ground-based surveys. 
as they do near-Earth object surveys, you have about 10 years of good survey before you need to go to a bigger telescope or to a new survey method. And so that's why we expect about 10 years of good survey from this, uh, from NEOWAS. And so what it's given us in this reactivated survey, again, primarily we're looking at characterization. So each point here is a near-Earth object we've seen in the first five years. The blue points are things that another survey discovered, and the black points are things that NEOWAS discovered. So we're showing here diameter against albedo, and the first thing that pops out, again, you can already see this bimodal albedo distribution in the Earth population, but what should be apparent from this distribution is that we are particularly sensitive to discovering large, low albedo near Earth objects. The things that other surveys miss, the things that are hard for the optical surveys. Because if you take an optical selection bias, the optical selection bias is around this area here. Whereas in a diameter limited survey, like you have a thermal infrared, you have a selection bias that's like this. And so it's this quadrant, this little triangle of phase space that we are most, that we are filling in basically. Other surveys are missing these things that are, you know, sometimes a kilometer. I mean, we're finding multi-kilometer near earth objects that are still being missed by ground based surveys because they look like a big chunk of coal and they're just not reflecting a lot of optical light. So, this is great, but why do we care about near-Earth objects? Right, what's the motivation behind near-Earth objects? And so this is Itokawa, which is taken from Hayabusa, and I just love it because it's a big gravel pile, and you have this giant thing that's you know just hanging off the end. Um, near-Earth objects come close to us, right? They're called near-Earth objects. That's why they have to come near the Earth. Um, and so this is a discovery, a frame of discovery. This is the W1 and W2 band uh, for the asteroid 2014 HQ124. And so this is what one of our human observers was sitting at the QA, I think it might have been me, and saw this, and the machine said, I think I found something. I'm like, yep, there's, there's the asteroid right in the middle of each of these things. And we added a little feature that stacks all those together, does a median stack, and oh yeah, there it is right there. And you can even start to pick out the stack in W1, even though it's not visible in the individual frames. Sure, send it to the Meyer Plan Center. They say, yep, this is put it on the near-Earth object confirmation page. And it turned out that this object was discovered at a declination of minus 70. And there were very few telescopes that can observe that far south. Even the ones in the southern hemisphere have a hard time getting that far over because point taking a giant telescope and tilting it on its side is dangerous wherever you are. And so I was able to get Gemini to push Gemini to get some follow-up observations. Uh, so I had an 8 meter telescope flip over and take observations. And the other observations came from a 0.6 meter telescope in New Zealand. And that was simply because they were able, it was higher in the sky for them, so they didn't have to try as hard to, you didn't have to fight as much atmosphere. And they were able to spend more time observing it. And what we found is that about six weeks after we discovered it, this object was going to have a close pass with the Earth, about three lunar distances away. And it was passing on the daytime side, so in between the Earth and the Sun. So it basically came from below the Earth went past us on the daytime sky and left above us. So if you weren't looking, if you're only doing a survey out into the nighttime sky, you would never find it. It's only by having this weird survey where we're looking above and below the Earth every day that we saw it. But because we found it, we were able to let our colleagues who do radar observations know, and they were able to get this movie, which at the time was the highest resolution is it running? Oh, no, sorry. It was the highest resolution radar images ever obtained. And so this was doing the uh, bi-static, cannot play movie. Oh, come on. Well, sorry. Uh, it basically just makes a movie of these pictures in the background. But this was the highest resolution images they had obtained. It came so close to Earth, they couldn't use the same telescope. They had to have two telescopes um, because they couldn't switch the receiver and transmitter fast enough. But you have this weird contact binary shape. You have some sort of strange depression here. That's in the radar shadow. And you have this little tail sticking off the back end, these two boulders pointing out. It's just a really strange thing. Um, I don't know if many of you remember, but in 2013, a giant bolide came in over Chelyabinsk, Russia. And it exploded. It released as much energy as the Hiroshima bomb did every second for 30 seconds. And the sky is over Russia. About, I think it was like 5.36 in the morning, just before sunrise. Um, and pieces of this meteor, of this uh, rained down and became meteorites or 
just littered the ground and people were collecting them. And uh, you can still buy some of them online. Um, although the market got shut down very quickly when some very burly gentlemen went to the houses and knocked and said, we hear you have rocks you found, you give them to us. And so the, um, the local organizers uh, collected a lot of the rocks. Um, but, you know, asteroids come close. There are occasionally impacts on Earth. And JPL has this great website that monitors that. This is from US government sensors. So these are satellites that are looking for nuclear test ban treaty violations. Uh, and after they get cleared and that they're not actually nuclear bombs, they get released publicly. And so we have a map of all of the things that are giant fireballs. And so there's Chelyabinsk. There was another one almost as big over the Bering Sea last year. It was just over the ocean, so no one noticed. Um, it actually took like a few months for anyone to notice that it had popped up on this plot. <laughs> so I was like, oh, yeah, we got hit by something big and you know, four months ago. Um, but we're watching, right? There are, you know, people are making these plots. We're paying attention to what's coming to us. Um, and, you know, sometimes big things hit the Earth, right? And so this is the obligatory slide I have to put about how the asteroid killed the dinosaurs. Because anytime you give a near-Earth object talk, you have to talk about the dinosaurs, because everyone loves dinosaurs. Um, and some people say, oh, well, it was actually volcanoes, or there was some weird dinosaur flu, and the asteroid, maybe it hit, maybe it didn't. But uh, a paper recently came out, which finally, despite the fact that there's like a 200-kilometer crater off the Yucatan, um, another paper came out showing, so this is the, the, the geologist renamed it, we used to call it the KT impact, and then geology decided to change the terminology, so now the KPG impact tungsten is what's deposited. Um, so this is the, you know, this dark material that band, that is the ash that was deposited as the forests of the world burned. Because anything that saw the meteor, the asteroid coming in, caught fire instantly. And then a lot of this material that was the melted rock that was sprayed around the Earth landed and then set a bunch of other global fires. So this is all the ash from that fire. And then this is the dust deposit that came down after. That's the iridium-rich deposit. Um, but in North Dakota, they found this, this research group found a bunch of glass spherules. So when you hit and have a giant impact, you expect to liquefy a bunch of silicates and make glass. And so they found some intact glass spherules buried in amber. They found some decayed ones that had been buried in with this. Um, but more interesting, they also found a whole bunch of fossils. They found here, this is a, so this is a ammonite shell, and these are fish freshwater uh, fish from that time period, and they were all deposited in the same direction and intermixed. And so you have freshwater fish, a saltwater creature, all deposited in the same layer of clay, pointing the same direction as though a giant wave ran from the ocean, picked up a bunch of stuff, ran through a lake, picked up a bunch of stuff, and dumped it on the shore. This was the tsunami that was resulting from the asteroid impact. How far, how far from the uh, I don't know the, at the time, but I mean, that was in the Mexican Peninsula, and this is all the way in North Dakota, so far. Yeah, yeah, thousands of kilometers. Um, and even worse, in some of these, so these are the fish fossils. They looked in the gills of the fish fossils, and so this is the fish head, and that's the gill, and you see those dots, and if you, do, if you color it funny, you get this dot, and you get that. These are those same glass spherules. So as the tidal wave was sweeping them up, Glass was raining down, and they were breathing it in and choking on it. It was a terrible day. <laughs> but it does seem to point to the fact that maybe it wasn't dinosaur influenza that killed the dinosaurs, but a giant rock really did hit us. Um, there was also a recent paper that did, a, I don't have the slides for it, but they did a core sample of the Chicks Loop crater. And they have now a basically minute by minute and hour by hour breakdown of the day the dinosaurs died from this geological layer because something like 80 meters of sediment was deposited in a single day. Yeah. And so they have, you know, okay, first we have this and now we have this magmatic up, we have the impact of magmatic upthrust, we have stuff cooling, then they have the tsunami that washed in because it drained of water and then broke and then the tsunami washed in. And so and they're like, okay, we have this deposit the tsunami this way, and then an hour later we have the rebound tsunami that deposited it again the other way. <laughs> yeah, so that, that paper, I'm still flipping through that one, but that's just, you know, there's a lot of new research coming out showing just how bad a day it was, and it turns out it was pretty terrible. Um, but 
you know, this is recently, in the farther past, near-Earth objects were probably one of the main things that delivered volatiles and organics to the Earth. Right? When the Earth was young, it was completely magmatic. A lot of the water had evaporated off. Anything that was organic was probably turned to CO2. So the organic building blocks of life were probably deposited later by things like asteroids and comets. And so looking at the near-Earth population today and how things get from the, the reservoir and the main belt and the comet population into the Earth helps us trace this history as well. And near-Earth objects make really great mission targets. So we have, you know, these are the, the circled, ob this is all the asteroids that have been visited by spacecraft, and these circled targets are all the near-Earth objects. And so we have you know, Cyrus Rex and Hayabusa 2 visiting now, uh, the original Hayabusa and near Shoemaker. As time goes on, we will get more and more missions going to NEOs because they're easy to get to, relatively. They have low energy requirements, and they're interesting. So the, at these surveys help motivate future missions. Now, the NEOs did, yes? Yeah, I have a question about what if you have all the mining, the NEOs, the mining, um, yeah, it, mining NEOs is great if you have a market. I don't think there's a market for stuff. Like, platinum is great until you drop 100 tons of platinum on the ground and the market drops out from under you. Um, so you want something you need in space. What you need in space is probably water. Mining water is probably very useful. The question is, do we have enough things and people in orbit that need water? And right now, no. 10 years, maybe. If you start having space tourism and people living on the moon, then yeah, maybe having a source of water you don't have to launch from Earth is great. But I don't know if it's there right now. Can you come back two slides before at the Dinosaur Pact? Yeah. What? No, the other one. This one? Yeah. What is this glass? This? Yeah. It's uh, so when the asteroid hit the hit the silicate, hit the crust of the Earth, it liquefied a bunch of stuff and sprayed it into the air, and then cool as it cools, it turns into glass balls on the way down. So it hit the crust of the Earth. Yeah, it melted the area it hit. Okay. Um, so, NEOWISE science, NEOWISE data have been used in over a thousand publications to date, and you can see that as the as the community got used to the data, the number of publications ramped up. And so, this you know, surveys are a legacy for the future, and so you know we encourage you to use them. And a little bit later in the talk, I'll tell you how to get the data so you can use it for your work too. Um, but some of the results that we've gotten out of this, and not all of those papers were from the NEOWISE team, obviously. There's a lot of work being done. Um, from a number of different teams around the world. Um, the main thing we did with NEOIs was try and figure out the number of actual one kilometer and larger NEOs out there in space. And by doing a synthetic simulation, we basically build a model population, run it through our survey because we know exactly where we were pointed at any time and exactly how sensitive we were. We were able to constrain all of that. We are able to go, okay, now, based on what we saw, so what we saw here is this black line, we model that we should have seen this dotted line based on this synthetic population. We can now constrain that there's 981 plus or minus 19 NEOs larger than a kilometer. So about a little bit less than 1,000. And over 90% of those are currently known. So this was what allowed us to say, yes, we have met the mandate that we find 90% of the one kilometer objects. How do you propose the synthetic population? Uh, so the synthetic yeah. yeah, it was basically you take what you know about the current NEO population, and you extend, you make reasonable assumptions for the parameters, but those parameters have varied. So how does the size frequency distribution change as you get to smaller sizes? It could ramp up, it could level off, and so you actually run a series of simulation, simulated populations through, and that's partly where that error bar comes from, is for the range of populations, you know, the distribution of inclination, distribution of eccentricity, you, you vary all these parameters and you do Monte Carlo simulations to get your error bar on this number. Um, we've also, we're also able to show the you know, correlation between taxonomy. So again, this is this taxonomy based on spectra compared with the albedo that we measured with NEOWISE. And so this distinctly here, you see that there is a clear correlation between objects with you know, S-type objects. This, this, the orange ones tend to be high albedo. The blue ones tend to be low albedo. These green ones, most of them are low albedo, but some of them are sneaking up here. Um, I will point out, so you'll notice that this graph is missing a bunch of small dark objects. 
This has that same bias in optical detection. That's not instituted by our survey. That's the fact that in order to get a taxonomy, you have to have been in the catalog before our survey, so discovered by an optical telescope, and then followed up with spectra. And if you go to a telescope, you say, I want to take spectra of three asteroids tonight, you're going to ask which are the three brightest and take spectra of those. And so you have a double optically bright preference to your selection effect, and so you get this kind of selection bias. So this, you know, the, you know this is diameter limited, this is based on a single optical cut, this is you know, cutting on basically optical brightness twice. Um, and that's why it looks like this orange population picks up. It looks like these small objects are brighter than the big objects. This is a selection bias. And so you have to be careful of how you interpret your data um, when you get these kind of results. And so this is one of the things I preach about every time I give a talk. <laughs> uh, it turns out planetary scientists, it, in astrophysics, optical selection effects are well known. Right? When you're looking at the colors of clusters of stars, this is something that is commonly dealt with. We haven't really dealt with this before in planetary science much, so it's something you have to remind people. Um, if we look at the distribution of albedos across the solar system, the Trojans are almost uniquely dark. The main belt is this you know, even mixture of dark objects and bright objects, and the NEOs are two-thirds bright and one-third dark. And what this is telling us is that the NEOs are not being selected as a fair draw from the main belt. There are preferential avenues that are selecting things from this peak of the main belt more often than from that peak of the main belt. And so we can use these albedo distributions for this kind of method. Um, and one of the other neat things is that we surveyed both Trojan clouds. And we have, again, this fair sensitivity. Um, we're not, we don't have to worry about weather. We don't have to worry about scene variations. So we can look at what's the ratio of objects in the leading and trailing cloud. And what we find in this debiased synthetic population is that the leading cloud has about 50% more objects than the trailing cloud. Now the dynamics should be even, right? The gravity is the same both in front of and behind the planet. So how you make this offset helps trace how Jupiter got to where it is and how the Trojans were captured. Because remember I said, these are gravitational wells. If nothing can get out, nothing can get in currently. So they had to have been in place in some sort of event like the Nice event where you had Jupiter and Saturn in resonance and stuff was able to move in these, those regions were unstable, and when they broke resonance, they became stable. And so this difference in population number helps trace, helps ba basically eliminate models from how you form the Trojan clouds and how you evolve the solar system. Uh, and going further out, we can look at the, so looking at the ratio of D-type Hildas to C and P-type Hildas, and the same for Trojans. And so if you just look at the Solomines, the Hilden Trojan population, while the Trojans are almost entirely D-type, the Hildas show are dominated by these D-type asteroids at small sizes, and there's almost none at big sizes. And again, this is speaking to what is populating these various resonances, because the Hildas are in a uh, three to two internal resonance with Jupiter. So that's very similar to the Pluto resonance, the Pluto's external resonance with Neptune, and the Hildas are on the Jupiter internal resonance. And so, again, how you populate this population versus that one, they seem to have been populated from different source regions. They have different compositions. Um, we've also been able to look at the amount of carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide gas, gas production in comets. So it turns out that our W2 band, our 4.6 micron band, covers the emission lines for CO and CO2. These are impossible to get from the ground because even a small amount of CO2 in our atmosphere completely wipes them out. So you can only sense them from space. And by comparing the long period comets in red with the short period comets in blue, unexpectedly we found that they don't really show any difference. They have this base level of activity as you get far from the sun, and then it ramps up as you get closer to the sun. And so this is probably where the water ice, so this line right here is where water ice starts sublimating. And so what you're seeing here is extra CO2 activity driven by water ice. Out here, you have CO and CO2 volatilizing on their own at a lower level, but we don't see a difference between populations. We thought we would. The long period comets come from the Oort cloud. 
which originally came from the Jupiter region. The short period comets are these things that were originally in the Kuiper belt and got rattled in, became centaurs, and then became Jupiter family comets. And so they are very different formation regions, but we're not seeing a difference in the amount of you know, CO2 versus water in these comets. This was very unexpected. Um, the way our survey works, we get 12 detections over about a day, and so we're able to look for asteroid binarity. We don't get very high dense light curves because we only observe it once every three hours, but we can see objects with these very large light curve changes. And so uh, one of our collaborators, Sarah Sonnet, is working on searching the, the Hildas and the Trojans for these contact binaries, these high amplitude things, because having a binary population in the Trojan cloud also tells you how these clouds were populated. How you capture a binary and maintain it as a binary as these gravitational interactions are happening sets limits on what, was, what could possibly be going on. Um, and I talked about the families yesterday, so I won't go over this, but I just want to highlight this one family up here. So this is the Euphrosyne family, and again, this is above that 20 degree cut that until we had the numerical uh, proper elements, we really wouldn't have noticed. Um, but Euphrosyne is funny because, so remember I said this, this limit right here, so this edge of the main belt is, is cut off by a resonance with the orbit of Saturn, and in particular how the perihelion of Saturn moves around, or how the uh, inclined note, ascending node of Saturn moves around with respect to the asteroid. And so at low inclinations, it's a tighter line, and as you get higher up to higher inclinations, low eccentricity cases and high eccentricity cases diverge, and so that's why the cutoff seems to stop here. But if you follow this out, it winds up going right through the middle of that family. And so, by tracing the history of this family, so Euphrosyne is uh, nearly 300 kilometers in size, very low albedo, um, with in our data set 1,400 objects, there's a couple thousand in the full data set. Uh, and in age, it's, what's interesting about it is it has an incredibly steep size distribution. So the number of objects in the cumulative size distribution is minus 4.4. So if you take a rock and you just break it up and you say there's as much mass in big things as small things, you would expect a slope of minus three. If you have most of your mass in big things, you would expect a slope of minus two, two and a half. And what we see for the general main belt, it's around between like 2.5, 2.7. To have such a steep size distribution implies that something is primarily removing the big things and leaving the little things around. And it turns out that it's that resonance passing right through the center of the family, that middle part where all the big stuff stays whereas the small stuff gets moved out by Arkovsky. And so we traced this family and took all these objects and said, okay, this resonance is useful for moving stuff into the Earth population, so if I propagate a bunch of simulated particles forward, where do they land in near Earth space versus where are all the near Earth objects in gray? And it winds up populating a strange part of space where there's only a small number of objects, but this is one of the unique ways of populating <coughs> this region of inclination, eccentricity, and semi-major axis space. So what we can do now is, for objects in this space, if we can confirm via spectra that they associate with the family, we now have a history for that object that goes back 800 million years. We can say it entered the near-Earth population a few million years ago. It was originally part of a breakup that happened 800 million years ago. And so, Unlike for most of the near-Earth objects, where they're kind of fresh and their, their origins have been lost, we can go get a direct origin for these objects. And so this is ongoing work. Um, right now, I'm collaborating with some people in uh, PSI in Hawaii. Um, and so what we saw when we looked at the objects that fell in that region versus all the NEOs, so all the near-Earth objects, again, have this preferentially high albedo population. Um, the things that fell in that dynamical region are the red points, and they tend to be darker, which is what you would expect. And so this motivated our search for spectra of these objects. So uh, I want to go quickly through what you can do, because all of this data is public. You can get all this data. All of our images are public. All of our catalogs are public. Um, we release the NEOWISE catalogs every year, along with images every year. You can go in and search for your favorite asteroid, and get all of the images for it from the cryo mission or the first up to the first five years of the NEOWISE reactivation survey. 
You can also search the catalogs to get photometry and astrometry. This is for asteroids as well as stars and galaxies. So this is useful for everyone. If you have an object that's of interest to you, check it out. We have nearly a decade of coverage. It's not dense like hers, but you can look for long-term variations. Our sensitivity is flat. So any changes you see on a decade time scale will show up in our database. If you're interested in the albedos and diameters, these are available on PDS. And so you can go to the planetary data system and download our entire catalog of diameters and albedos. Um, so real quick, at the end of our time here, let me talk about what our next plan is. So we've been working on a next generation mission that we've called NEOCAM, a near Earth object camera. Uh, this is led by Amy Meinzer, again, who just moved to University of Arizona because I haven't updated these slides. Um, and this is slightly bigger, 50 centimeters, with, again, these Mercad tell detectors, but they've, an advanced technology, we've basically changed the way, changed the ratio of elements in these detectors, so now they're sensitive to 10 microns without any coolant. So this machine is passively cooled. So the only thing on board, there's a cover that pops off, and then there's hydrazine, because we're, we're going to put it at the Earth's Sun L1, so there's hydrazine to dump momentum. There is nothing else consumable on board. And so the idea is we're designing this to follow, to discover near-Earth asteroids, to discover hundreds of thousands of them, to do its own follow-up, to get the thermal infrared characterization that gives us the diameters, and to do it all in a way where you're not limited by any lifetime. There's no lifetime limitation to the spacecraft. As long as the spacecraft keeps working, as long as the electronics work and we test it for 10 years, it should fly. There's nothing to run out of. Um, so we expect around 300,000 NEOs detected, around 8 million main belt asteroids. And the reason it's so good for the near-Earth objects is you can see the shape. It looks really pointy and tall. This is mostly an empty box and an empty sun shield. This is because we want to look down to 45 degrees solar elongation. And so we need to have this cut here to keep everything in the dark and the shadow of the sun shield. But by looking at 45 degree elongation, we get down and we look across the Earth's orbit. So the goal of the mission, find two thirds of the, astro of the NEOs larger than 140 meters within five years and 90% within 12 years. And then do a find enough objects above 50 meters that you can do a statistical analysis of the threat they pose. A recent study by the uh, NASA uh, science definition team looked at a variety of ways of, do, figure, of doing those science cases. So how many years does it take to get 90% of the hazard for a one meter infrared space-based telescope, ground-based four meters, uh, and the one that NeoCam fills is this one. So it's the cheapest. And it's a little bit longer. If you had done a one meter in space, it'd be about you know, 1.2 billion instead of 600, 700 million. And it would save you a couple years. So this is the region of phase space we're looking for here. Um, here's our detector. So NC2, so NeoCam2 and NeoCam1 bands, they're designed to be both thermally dominated for near-Earth objects. This gives us a strong constraint on what the thermal behavior of the asteroids are. Again, this is the thermal emission SED and the optical reflection. Uh, and one thing to point out, this thin line here, it's kind of a confusing chart, goes to this axis here. Or I'm sorry, goes to this axis here. This is the number of stars per square degree brighter than an NEO, our standard NEO. In the optical, you're dominated by stars. Stars are brighter than near Earth objects. In the infrared, there are no stars. There's no stars left that are brighter than your targets. And so this band here, where you can see they're about comparable, actually is critical to the mission because it lets us constrain our astrometric catalog. Because if you fly with this alone, you have great sensitivity to near-Earth objects, but you wind up having such a big field of view, there's not enough stars to do an astrometric solution. So we want this band because, again, this will be co-bore-sighted with a beam splitter in between, so you know where you have a better idea of where you're pointed. Um, in terms of the quality of diameters, if we compare diameters from occultations to diameters fitted from when you have a, from NEDA, when you have a fitted beaming parameter, you have multiple thermal bands, we find these dotted lines here are 10% offset. We find that the majority of them are within 10%. So infrared does give you good diameters. And uh, okay, so I talked about this. This is an image of the detector. Uh, now, one thing, one great piece of advice I was told is if 
someone says, here's a picture of a detector, be suspicious. If they say, here's a picture from my detector, then you know it actually works. So this is a picture from the detector. It's a dark image. Uh, it's not, there's no sources supposed to be here, but you, we actually can get pixels out of the you know, values from pixels. So we're making good progress. This is the detector uh, in the lab. Um, and so the nice part is it exceeds all the requirements. In particular, it operates around 40 Kelvin, which we can do passively. The cutoff is above 10 microns. And more than 90% of the pixels meet our dark current specification. So in our three minute exposures, we're not going to be dominated by noise from the detector. And so what this lets us do is carry out a survey floating at the Earth's Sun L1 and cover this blue region of space. So the survey will progress here, look down to 45 degrees from the sun, looking along the Earth's orbit, because the most hazardous asteroids have orbits just like the Earth's. And so you want to look along the Earth's orbit. So we'll do this patch of sky and flip over to that one, and then come back 13 days later. So it's basically a 13-day cycle, and we just arch through the sky, taking data. We don't change the survey. We don't do anything different. And not only does this allow us to be very efficient at detecting objects, but at the end, you know exactly where you were pointed. You know you had the regular coverage pattern. So it becomes easier to debias the survey and say, OK, from what I detected, what, do, what should there be in, in space? And so this is just kind of a schematic. So we start with down here. Each of these little boxes is, a, is one of our images, which is 14 square degrees. We march in a little cycle. We do four of these. We build up a stack of bricks across the sky. Um, so here's the stack of bricks. Then we do three stacks of bricks on each side of the sky, running from 45 elongation to 120. So that would be one side of the sun. Flip to the other side. Repeat, repeat, repeat. And so what that looks like, come on, play. OK. So what that looks like is this. So this is showing what the survey would detect over the first couple years just marching in the sky. So a white object is the first time we've ever detected a near-Earth object. Green is just everything that we've now been able to catalog, been able to get a good orbit for. What I'll point out is, so the blue line here is the Earth's orbit, and this is, we're just marching around. This is only showing the near-Earth objects larger than 140 meters. There will be about a factor of five more near-Earth objects that we detect, and a factor of 20 more main belt asteroids that are off this plot. We expect to detect around a million objects every week in the, in throughout all the populations, 8 million objects. Because the main belt doesn't move much, those 8 million main belters we detect, we detect in the first year, and then again in the second year, and again in the third year. We're covering a lot of objects. And if you stare at this, it goes, yeah, OK. Uh, I don't know why that got in there twice. Um, doesn't show up twice here. Weird. Um, so what does this mean is if you do, if you simulate this survey with a simulated population, you get the NeoCam blue line. Now this was for our proposal when we launched in 2021. NASA recently said that they're going to move forward with our mission, renaming it the NEO surveillance mission, but effectively it's based on all the same technology and the same team, with a launch around 2025, 20-ish. Um, the black line here is LSST, and so when you combine the blue and the black, you get the green line. And so what we know currently, plus what LSST will give us and what NeoCam will give us, will allow us, as a worldwide community, to meet this 90% goal. So in conclusion, I just want to say that you know, surveys like NeoWise provide this treasure trove of data. And I encourage all of you to look at it, both for asteroids, stars, galaxies. There's a lot of interesting stuff in there. There's more data than any of us on the team could ever look at. We need the rest of the community to be using this to be looking at to find the cool stuff. We can't find everything. We want it to be as useful as possible. Um, infrared allows us to get some physical properties you really can't get any other way in an unprecedented fashion. And albedos provide this critical association for families, for compositions, for origin of the NEOs. So in closing, I just want to say thank you to all of you for coming to these lectures. It's been a pleasure to meet with you. It's been a pleasure to get to talk to you and to interact with you over this week. I encourage you, please stay in touch. If you have questions for me, send me emails. I would love to hear from all of you. I'd love to hear for how your careers progress. If you get into planetary science and you have questions about stuff, ask me. So thank you very much.